You were amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely amazing. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love the 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 long range unit. Uh, oh yeah, the Cockney accents you bring out with with Dusty and all those guys. Oh yeah, my yeah. god, I wet myself <laughs> because they because so, you bring the humour to it. Put some wood on the fire, Wilf. Captain says that's the best way to keep off the animals. Never thought I'd be sleeping in a tent with bleeding lions all around me, said Stu. Mrs. Phil Potts little boy in the middle of darkest Africa. Oh, f***, shouted Wilf. What's the matter? said Dusty, getting up quickly. Knock me f***ing shin on the Bowser bar. Is that all? said Dusty. F***ing hurt it did. You come and try it. Dusty sat back in his camp chair and pulled a packet of woodbine out of his tunic pocket and lit a cigarette. I've never had it, said Stu despondently. What? asked Harry. A woman? Never had one? Go on, said Dusty, kicking him. Privates get three bob a day. Women want to go to the pictures, want to go dancing. They want picking up and taking back again. Costs money. Privates can't afford it. Neither can Lance Corporals. You had one, Harry? asked Stu. Only a pro in Piccadilly. Saved up for two f months. Well, right. Heather Stretch, how are you? I'm very well, and how are you? Very good. I'm ticking off a couple of firsts with your one because I work on audiobooks with authors all over the world. So far, I've spoken to authors in the USA and Canada and the UK, Ireland, one in China. Did a time travel book with a bloke in China. Um, you're the first one I've done from Portugal. Excellent. And also the first time I've talked about an audio book I've done where I'm not talking to the author. Yeah, so, sadly. Yeah, sadly, absolutely sadly. Because yeah, when I did yeah. some <clears throat> research on on Peter Rimmer, I'm so, is there a book about him, about his life? Well, he would say to you, read my books. <laughs> That's what he would say. Well, yes. Okay. Well, uh, well, we'll get to that too. Uh, First of all, then, let's clear up the other point. Why are you in Portugal? Ah, uh, it's a good question. Um, I was um, working in the corporate world about six years ago and um, got to the point where I'd had enough. And uh, I, was, I was going up and down the countryside, you know, up north, going into Wales, all... You name it, I was, I was traveling the UK. I was an IT trainer. So, um, and actually I was working for Network Rails, my last contract. And it got to the point where it was, I was getting, starting to feel old. And um, so, no, my husband and I, we, he's, he's a retired fire fireman. So we both decided, you know what, let's get rid of the rat race. Let's get a caravan. And that's what we did. And we headed off to France and uh, spent six months in France, hoping we were going to settle there, but it didn't work out. And we, we just drove into Portugal and, and just kind of stayed. And That's so, the kind of adventurous spirit that your father had, from what I can tell. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I, but, I, you know, you, you know, I'm not from, from the UK anyway, so I've had this, you know, massive kind of urge to travel all the time. So, yeah, I mean, we've been here in Portugal now for six years, and I, but I can't see us going anywhere else. It's um, It seems unlikely. You know, we have a home in central Portugal and actually I'm down at the moment down in the Algarve because we've got a holiday apartment here. So that's so. why my nose is slightly red because I got <laughs> caught yesterday. Okay. It's not because you've had a drink before the interview. No. Okay. No, Just it, thought I'd it, check. it always, oh, it, it, I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh, my nose, but never <laughs> mind. That's the way it goes. All right. So, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, you, you were born in South Africa because your father was in Johannesburg for a while. So is that where you were born? I, no, I was born in Zimbabwe. So what was Rhodesia? Oh, you were born? Oh, wow. Days. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I'm trying to keep up so, with the story. Uh, the story of his life is amazing. <laughs> uh, so it's your late father's yeah. book. Tell me about your dad. Yeah. yeah so, so dad um, was born in 1937 um, and he died in 2018. And he ha oh, had an amazing life. He and his brother, they, well, first of all, before he left England, he was in the RAF and he was there for two years and apparently um, he was the youngest pilot officer of the time. Not that he flew planes, but he was just in the RAF. Um, and his father had been an insurance broker and uh, had his own company in London, uh, but his father had died just, just after the war. Um, 
and you know it 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 kind of upset the whole family and the way they were operating and well, not operating the way they lived because um the family got hit by death duties and, and that had quite a massive effect on my dad the way he thought through the rest of his life right. um but after he left the RAF, um he thought oh, i could go into father's business and you know be an insurance broker and, and keep catching the train to waterloo every day and he just thought i can't do that but his mother ha had a cousin um uh, called chris and um chris had been in um let's we'll say burma during the war um had it also been out to rhodesia and and in those days it was just an enormous unknown country it was a colonial country but very unknown and he talked to his his cousin's two sons constantly about this beautiful idyllic place called Rhodesia and so dad left the RAF at the age of 19 um they I suppose he I don't know what he did thereafter but when he was 21 um he and his brother left for Africa on a ship left the port of London and, and they didn't know um, anyone there no contacts or anywhere to go no, no just nothing, off they went no. proper adventure off they went proper adventures brothers a little bit older and the idea was uh, my uncle wanted to farm and farm tobacco and um dad thought yeah he's going to do the same thing but hated it and oh. so he didn't go into farming he went into insurance right and right, so um he met my mother, uh, they married, I came along. Uh, then uh, some years later, they separated and dad by that So state how did you come along in Zimbabwe then, when they were in South Africa? Well, That's the bit I can't No, mum and, no, because I was born in Rhodesia. So my mum and my dad just met as, as you do meet. And my mum was English. She'd also come out to Africa as well. Right. Um, and so they'd met and they, they'd lived several years in Rhodesia, I'm going to say about three or four years together in Rhodesia, um, with my dad working in the insurance uh, brokerage business. And when they split up, he had by that stage positioned himself in Johannesburg right. and went on to build himself um, an international insurance brokering company. I mean, he opened, but, he opened businesses in the US and Hong Kong and just, it was global. Absolutely. Yeah, it was global. Yeah, he was global. Um, and yeah, he's, he's, he was very dynamic. Um, he was, uh, I'm going to say quite a difficult man. Okay. Um, he, he wasn't particularly emotional on the outside, but very much inside and a very emotional man because it's, it's so prevalent in his books. It's, it's quite crazy. Well, I mean, I was, that, that's the big, that's the, the biggest surprise you've just given me is because, you know, there's a lot of emotion through the book. Yeah. I mean, I've only yeah, read the one, yeah. I've only read Ben with the Wind, but there's so much emotion. Right. So it surprised me when you said yeah. he was an emotional man. Yeah. He was, no, but he, he just didn't show yeah. it. Yeah. Just didn't express it. It just didn't, never came out. So, um, but his whole life was geared around business and, and Ben with the Wind talks a lot about business, um, as you will have gathered. Mm. And, and all his other books generally have got some form of business going on in it. Mm -hmm. um, and And more than likely it's going to be either insurance or it's going to be the stock market. Right. Um, but deep down the passion was writing. So and all this time he's right. And do yeah. you know how many, how many books did he write during his lifetime there? Um, we think I keep losing track of it, but we published 22 so far. And, um, I think we're going to hit around about 30 if, but we'll see. We'll see because some of it's very early. Now um, you're saying you you publish it. Does that mean he didn't have anything published while he was alive? No, he did. We published okay. well. So um, in the mid '90s, um, he got Harper Collins Zimbabwe to publish two of his novels, right. which was no mean feat. Yeah. So that was cry, so that was Cry of the Fish Eagle, which is a story about Rhodesia going from it was about a lad um, who left England just after the war had no nothing to lose went out to Rhodesia um, and went through the whole Rhodesian bush warfare um, up until the time the country became Zimbabwe so that's about Rhodesia right then the second book that Harper Collins published is called um, God my mind's gone completely blank vultures in the wind yes. um, and 
for me personally, it's probably my most favorite because it's it's my dad and it's it's his life story, I would say, in a lot of ways, although he denied it. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it tells his, his life in South Africa and his business life and his take on the human being and the take on apartheid because the chat, the main character in the book, his best friend is a black guy who's going through all the crap that went on in South Africa during those years. Yeah. Um, and it's an extremely powerful book. Um, it's a bit like Marmite. Some people love it. Some people are not so keen on it, yeah. but for me, it's, it's the historical, um, relevance to it is so important. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's what happened in the 1990s. So they both got published and dad thought, wow, I've made it, I've done it. But Harper these are Collins his first two books out the gate. He's with Harper Collins. That's no, yeah. that's so much. No. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But it, but it didn't take, it just didn't go anywhere else. It didn't go worldwide. It was just contained within a real sadness, I think for him, um, okay. you know, because it, he, he desperately tried through the years, you know, to, to get books published. And after he died, we found many letters from agents uh, saying, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean, I'm talking hundreds of letters. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, so that happened. Um, and he kept going on at me about my books, my books. And I was just so disinterested because I was a young woman, um, embarking on my own life and, you know, and I was in the IT world and, but anyway, we got to about the year 2007, I would say, 2008, and things in, in the book industry were starting to really take off. Is this because um, of Amazon? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was it was Moby Pocket in those days. So right, okay. Um, he kept niggling at me. Come on, you can you can do something. You can help me with this. I'm going. Oh, I don't think I can do this. And eventually, we started to play with it. And um, I was still working in my IT role, didn't really have the time for it. Um, and it was only until um, around 2014, um, I'd recently married for the second time. And I decided that my husband and I should go out to South Africa and, and for him to meet my father. Right. And I was just on the cusp at that stage thinking my, you know, my career needs to change. I, you know, I was becoming, I was a, very much a mature woman by that stage. Um, and during that trip to South Africa, um, I went back home saying to my dad, yep, yeah, I, I will do it full time. And wow. So you took it on. Yeah. Are there other siblings took it as on. well? Are there, have you got other no, brothers and sisters? No, I see. No, I see. Just right. Me. So it really just was me. the pressure was on you. No one else was going to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so I republished at that point, um, uh, Vultures in the Wind and Cry the Fish Eagle. And, and I was still working. Um, and wow. after that, I took one of his manuscripts, um, back with me to England, uh, for echoes from the past, uh, called echoes from the past is the first in the Brick and Shaw series. Yeah. And, um, I began to type that up as, you know, whenever I had the moment and it, cause it, it, these books are, well, that particular book was about 160,000 words. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, when I did like Ben with the, the wind, wind, it was when I recorded Ben with the wind, when I finished recording, it was 19 hours, which I think is the That's longest right. audio book I've done. <laughs> I think oh, it's God, really. Yeah. I haven't, oh, I've, wow. you know, yeah, oh, wow. they're usually around between six and 10 usually, but yeah, no. absolutely. But, but, but it never lets up the story, the story, you know, it, it, it it's the story of a fact. Sorry. Oh. Sorry. We'll get to, we'll get to the book in a minute. Just, just finish where you were okay. at when you were with the story of, of getting them published. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so I, I, you know, it's so long ago now. It's almost like <laughs> what happened, you know. Yeah. Um, and I and I managed to get it up onto Amazon by that stage, yeah. and um, on Kindle. But I didn't. Yep. Yeah, but I didn't do the proper editing because I was so green. I just had absolutely no clue. And I thought, well, I can edit it. <laughs> Not likely. Um, and so, but it, it went out into the wild, and I got a cover design for it, and the same with. With the other two books, I got new covers designed for them, yeah. but it was such a mammoth learning curve. It was just, um, it was extraordinary. Um, but I continued and I think we did another two or three books before he died. So, so you got them out there. Yeah, we got them out there. And, um, for him, it was, 
you know, we'd have we'd have a monthly call. It was like being in a business meeting, you know, around a boardroom, you know. <laughs> you say, right, give me the figures. Right, right. What are you doing about this? And what are you doing? <laughs> oh, that's extraordinary, really. <laughs> um, but it was all good fun, you know. And it was, you know, when I spoke to him, which is generally once a month, you know, I'd, I'd give him the, the rundown of, of where we were at and how many we had sold and which is a far cry as to what we're doing now. And I, wish, I so wish he was alive now because he'd be, quite blown away I think um but yeah um so then it got to 2017 and my son joined my husband and I um in Portugal he was at a crossroads in his life uh he had been a chef and got to the point where that was not going to be his career and so he joined me in the business and so we've been working together ever since and so my dad knew that he knew that his grandson was working on his books yeah um and I think he was, you know, pretty touched by that and, um, yeah, pretty moved by it. So there's really three and generations involved here as custodians absolutely. of the work. That's lovely. Absolutely. You, you know, but you know the right thing's going to be done because if you put it in the hands of an agency or a publisher, you know, yeah. they're not going to yeah. care as much as you three. No, <laughs> you know, to start no. And, and we did. Yeah. And the sad part was um, my son hadn't seen um, his grandfather um, or... 13 years, I think, maybe longer than that. Yeah. So my dad had only known him as a very young lad, you know, not this this adult. And we'd planned to go to South Africa in the November of 2018. And suddenly we got a call in July 2018 that he just suddenly dropped dead. Goodness me. And so, so my son Toby never got to see his grandfather at that stage. Oh. So that was immensely sad. Um, but we picked up the pieces. We flew out to South Africa and picked up every single manuscript we could find because my dad's house was like walking into, uh, well, how can I put it, um, into spider paradise and cobweb paradise because he hated anybody in his house. He, he hated anybody cleaning or he became such a recluse in his last right. 10 years or so. So it was good fun just squirreling and trying to find where all these manuscripts were that we knew were around the house. And your mum had passed we... away before that then? How, no, how no, my mum's, no, my mum's um, my mom's still alive in the UK. Um, okay. She lives in a care home. But um, no, my mum and dad got divorced when I was four or five. I see. Okay, and, right. right. Yeah. But he did remarry and um, Kathy was only four years older than me. I think it was something crazy like that i've forgotten now um but sadly she died a very nice young um right. yeah and he also had, they had a child together but the child didn't didn't make the day the day he was born right so right. a lot of that all of that history of his personal life comes into a lot of his writing yeah yeah. So not with Ben to the Wind because that wasn't at that stage, but his later books. It, it no, but much there, there's a lot in Ben with the Wind. I would say if if somebody enjoys the work of say Ken Follett or Wilbur Smith or Jeffrey yeah. Archer, it's you you it, it's better than those. But I think you'd enjoy them because there's just so much in it and it never lets up. It, it's no. it's not just one story; it's several stories because it starts out. It's basically it's it's a family. A very old, well-to-do family. Did he come from that kind of background, or, or was that? Oh, that he came. So that was 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 that when they describe, you know, the big house and the family and all the brothers and sisters and the patriarch and the matriarch and everything. It, was that the kind of environment he grew up in? Probably not to that extent, but right. um, he the family home was in Ashstead, uh, in right. Surrey, and yeah. my dad went to a public school. I don't you might have heard of Cranley School um, yeah. in Surrey. Yeah. So he had that initial upbringing. He had a nurse when he was a little boy. Um, he had, had an, an older sister, an older brother, um, and they lived in this 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 fabulous house in called the Woodlands. Um, right. Whilst you know, whilst my dad, my granddad had this this amazing international insurance company as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's where I think some of that comes from. But I, I, he's, he's a writer, so a lot of it was embellished. Yeah. And of course, you know. Um, yeah. So. But then so he, yeah, he works in the city in London in insurance and then <coughs> and he's got contacts all over the world in America, in, in Hong Kong and sing well in Singapore and in Germany, which yeah. then leads to a very interesting place once the Second World War breaks out. 
Did did Absolutely. do you know do you know whether your dad well he must have had business contacts mustn't he in Germany and um, all over done. Europe I'm guessing yeah I, 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 he must have done and there's a lot that I don't know and it's so frustrating because when we were planning to go and visit him the idea was to really bombard him with a lot of information so that we could tell people so there's a lot I'm missing he yeah. there's a lot he told me hell yeah. of a lot he told me but there's a lot um, I'm, I'm I've lost. And that's a hell of a shame. Yeah, um, because I did a toss up before we did this interview because I had to do the voices of each character in the 18.7 hours that uh, Bend With The Wind runs as an audio book. And do you want to have a guess at how many characters your dad wrote that I had to do? And and some of the, some of the minor characters aren't even included in this. I mean, they're, they're probably as minor as say a doorman. I'll do the I'll do a doorman because I know they might go back through that door again, and they 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 did. I have a the way I work is I have a voice file where I when a character makes their first appearance, I I save that bit of audio so that when the character comes back uh, later on, okay. I can go back to it. So there's some consistency. Do you want to have a guess how many characters have have speaking parts in in the eighteen point seven hours? I'm going to say 30, but maybe 35. Okay. It's 151. Oh, my God. You're joking. <laughs> no. And I think that's the most I've done. It's 151. And it surprised me. But, um, wow. yeah. So he wrote. He, he was, I mean, sure, I was having to keep track of them because I was having to voice them. But yeah. he, he, when he wrote this book, he had 151 yeah. different characters yeah. that he kept track yeah. of and they developed through the story yeah. and things happened to them and they got married and they had different relationships yeah. and, you know, there, were, there yeah. were deaths and all sorts of things. He kept all that either in his head or yeah. written in some plan, but he must have had some written. mind to, to yes. do that because the story yeah. isn't, it isn't, you'd think, oh, you know, 18.7 hours and 151 characters in an audio book. There's no way you can follow along with that. You do. You, you'd not, yeah. you, you're at no time. Do you think, no, wait a second, which one's he, who's he related to? What's no, uh, never because it is, it's yeah. so well written that you see, okay. Yeah. So, well, he's that guy. Now he's in the army now and now he's an officer and he's in charge of him and then they lead this troop and they go at no time did i get lost at no time and oh, that's um, brilliant so this yeah. is what kind of mind your dad had <laughs> like i say yeah. there should be there, there should be some kind of you know a movie made of him or something because the life he's had to for, to, to brush against that many people that he can draw upon because i'm guessing yeah. as an author he's drawing from people he's met massively so for, for these characters yeah, yeah. Um, he said yeah, he it's... had a, um, a photographic memory and he could absolutely recall things so when he he was very he was very dynamic his boy, voice was booming i mean and he was a small man he was five foot eight um but he had this this presence uh, but he listened to people so when they were telling him their life story it all went in right. and it 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 comes out in various ways so uh, I'm just going to use Reggie Beaumont as an example. There, there'd be My favourite character. He's the central character, really, yeah. to be fair, isn't he? And Reggie yeah. must be based, Is he must be based a little bit on your father because yeah. the insurance thing and the RAF. Got to be. Got yeah. To be. yeah. Got to yeah. be. I mean, I don't yeah. know for certain. I, I you know, I, I, I referred to Vultures in the Wind where I said, you know, the guy in there, um, uh, his name is Matt. Um, he's to me is my dad, except Matt is six foot tall and my dad was, well, was more than six foot tall and my dad's five foot eight. So I'm not quite sure where the, the <laughs> where, where that comes in, but um, yeah, uh, it, an extraordinary man. Um, uh, yeah, incredible. Um, what a wonderful legacy but, but, to leave you for one thing, but to leave the world as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and for me, it's because, uh, particularly about the history, not so much it comes into Ben with the Wind, but the history of Rhodesia, yeah. um, which is really what his Brick and Shaw Chronicle series is about. It's it's about what happens from the beginning, from 1887 to the time Mugabe comes into power and beyond. Yeah. Um, it's for me that history is such a short period in in, in history. Yeah. I'm I'm determined it's not going to be lost. Right. And yeah. And I want people from all around the world to 
to know about the story. And, and I see it on a day-to-day -day basis. People saying, I never knew about this history of Rhodesia. It's fascinating. It's amazing. Yeah. So, and these are people in America and yeah, but far reaching. So yeah, it's important to me. Really important. Yeah. Great. Well, you can find out more about, if you go to peterrimmer.com, so peterrimmer.com, yeah. I'll put a link in the description on YouTube. Um, yeah. You can find out more about Peter Rimmer because he's, uh, he's, a, he's a fascinating, he is a fascinating bloke. Um, yeah, he is. Here's, here's one thing I want to, I want to, I, I hope I don't embarrass you, but there yeah. is a little bit of sex in the book. Um, yeah. How did you feel reading that, knowing your dad had written it? Absolutely. So listening to you, <laughs> reading yeah. it out it's like oh my god i can't believe this um i'm i'm having to listen to it again and um so I, i'll go back to when i was about 24 25 and my dad had um he had written bend of the wind probably in the early 80s so um he had tried to get well he did have a literary agent in london um a very well-known literary agent and they were going to buy it they were going right. to option, you know, and um, then and sadly, it, they, they, they declined and said they had no idea how to market the book. That was their excuse. I, so and when was this? In the, ninth, in the in the 80s. That's surprising they, because they the likes no of idea. Wilbur Smith was probably one of the best selling authors in the uh, 80s. Uh, okay. it's, it's very difficult to know. It's, 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 you know, we just don't understand what the thinking was behind it. But anyway, it, it got turned down. So I was living in the UK. My dad was in South Africa. So he had asked uh, the agent to send the manuscript back to me uh, with with its sequel, which you're going to be doing in July. Okay. Cool. And um, and so it got sent back to me and I thought, I hadn't read anything of dad's. And I thought, do you know what? I think I better read, get an idea and see what he's like, if he can really write. Yeah, yeah. So you hadn't read and his so, stuff before? <clears throat> No, never read it. Never read anything. Okay. And unfortunately, okay. Bend with the Wind was not the one to start with. <laughs> and so I sat down with this, this, you know, A4 typed up book. And I think I got to into page 30. And I think it's a scene that you will recall where it is um, Tug and... Yes, in the, um, in the field. Yeah. Um, yes, outdoors. That's right. Yes. And it's not too bad. That wasn't no. too bad, that scene. No, not too bad. And, it's, thought, and they're in love, and it's they're young, and it's it's before the war, and it's there's there's romance. It's romance. It's romance. But I had heart yeah. failure. I could. I thought, oh my, I can't believe. I no, I can't read this. <laughs> this is beyond me. This is utterly beyond me. <laughs> Closed it up, put it back in the package, and it sat there for the next one well, until I, until I got it out again. Right. And okay. decided we had to do something with it. Mm -hmm. And it was a real struggle. I, I, I can't deny it. And, and my husband was helping me through the edit, what I, because I do initial editing. And um, there were times it was like going redder and redder kind of thinking, oh, oh this is just crazy. Because as you know, it, it becomes very explicit at times. Yes, it does. Uh, and, especially in, uh, in Southeast <clears throat> Asia. Yeah. A, absolutely. And in yeah. fact, I had to do a lot of editing there. Okay. Because right. it, did you ever, did it ever cross your mind to take it out altogether? Um, no, but I wish I had done now after listening to you <laughs> and thinking, oh God, why did I leave it in? And I think it's because at the time I was so new to this business that, um, I felt, I, I, oh, one of the things my dad always used to say to me, do not remove any comma, do not do this, do not do that, which yeah. I've learned now you absolutely do that kind of thing. You know, you don't listen to the author on that score. Oh, so I think I had that in the back of my mind. You know, yeah. don't remove anything because he's written it. Yes. Um, Plus, it's your dad and, and so, you want to do the right. Oh, you, you, yeah, you, it's his book. It's not your work. Yeah. Or you're not yeah. removed. It's not like you're editing a book and being paid to edit the book by someone as a, as a job. It's your father's work. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I thought I, just... had to do honor, I have to honor it, you know. Mm. Yeah. And anyway, at the sequel, Each to His Own, um, I think we released it, I'm going to say, two years ago. And, um, oh, I, I, I knew what I was doing by that stage. Well, I'm not saying yeah. I knew what I do, but I thought, no, no, this, this, this can't continue in this vein. No, dad, that's and enough. <laughs> that's enough. And, and there was, there was 
two pages. It was a chapter. And I looked and I thought, what? It's got no relevance. Right. It was ridiculous. And I said, right. no, that's it. Right. It's gone. Okay. So it doesn't appear. It's right. still okay. quite it's still quite fruity, but it's, okay. it's a lot better than it was. Yeah. Well, I look forward so, to look forward to doing that one. And I, <laughs> had you turned any of the others into audiobooks before this one? Yes, um, "Cry the Fish Eagle" is an audiobook. Great. Um, yeah, um, it's possible that we probably will re-record it at some point. Um, oh, really? What was there an issue with it? I, I would I wouldn't like to go into too much detail, but okay. it's it's Fine. yeah. yeah. Um, but yes, I think it. I think we need to readdress it and have it right. redone. Absolutely. Well, how did you uh, find the experience of turning "Bend with the Wind" into an audiobook? Oh, it's completely different. Yeah. Absolutely different. In a good way. A different experience. Oh God, yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you know, because um, we we also work on uh, the Brigginshaw Chronicles, and I hadn't found you at that stage. We've got another fabulous narrator, so he's working on the third book in the series at the moment. Great. Great. Um, and then again, before I found you, we have another narrator who's done a duet, uh, which we call uh, The Pioneers. And that is very early Rhodesia, right. um, set in the 18, 1880s up to the, the Boer War. Right. Um, and so that's just been finished and they've just been published. So so this is um, the new thing is now is to get them as audio books. As the, yeah. Because it's the hot, yeah, audio books are so. the hot thing at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's yeah. um, and, it's growing so fast with thanks to Audible. It's, oh, it's amazing! But the thing was, Graham, I was going to do it. So, Were you? Well, are yeah, you still I, thinking of doing that? Because I can help you if got, you want. Got a boost set? What? Well, no, no, no. We decided no. We need a professional. I can't do accents. You, you are amazing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely amazing. <laughs> I mean, I love, I love the 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 long range unit. Uh, oh, yeah. The Cockney accents you bring out with, with Dusty and all those guys. Oh yeah, my yeah. God, I wet myself because they because so, you bring the humour to it. Well, they're soldiers, Absolutely. so I had to, and it's written that way that they're soldiers and they've yeah. been they've been through a lot. And soldiers can have a dark sense of humour, and there's some shortcuts, and they give each other a hard time, like guys yeah. guys hanging out in anything like a sports club or anything. But I'm I'm imagining yeah. soldiers like that. So I had to make sure that that kind of comradeship and that you know, that kind of thing came across. And once I'd got the voices for each of them, it became easy because they became they became real characters. But it wasn't it wasn't that hard anyway because they're so well written characters. They're not two dimensional yeah. at all. Oh, they were good yeah. fun. I mean, because the language was terrible. <laughs> but you brought it out in a Cockney accent, and and my my husband loves being to the wind, and he's dying to listen to it. So it's I need I need to sort it out so that he can listen to it. Um, oh, that's great. But yeah, I'm glad I. That I, 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 I Oh, is it? You did it brilliantly. And, and Reggie's voice that you've got is very droll. It's very, you know. Um, well, when I, when I read it, he seemed like he was the most together character in the whole book. He, he yeah. had everything worked out. He was an honorable guy. He, you know, he yeah. didn't have a particular love interest to lead him astray. I mean, I'm not having a go, but he, he no. stayed very focused on who he was. And he, he seemed to know yeah. who he was and understand who he was and understand how the business worked. And so I had yeah. to get that across that he was this safe pair of hands, but also a charming guy, too. He wasn't boring yeah. by yeah. any means. And I had to get all yeah. that across. And then I found the voice for him. And then he became really quite he was my favorite yeah. character in the whole book. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. He yeah. he continues, Great. but it's some years later. It's some years later, and it's the children who come into it. So oh. it's the children's story. Right. So, so this is a that, generational that's... thing too. Yeah. Absolutely. So this will... And yeah. And I think probably he would have continued that, but for right. some reason, again, I don't I, I don't know why. Um, he then wrote "Cry the Fish Eagle" and then "Vultures in the Wind." Yeah. And then once that was done, then he started in 1998, the Brigginshaw Chronicles, and he was writing that to the day he died. Wow. Wow. So he yeah. didn't get to finish that uh, that trilogy? No, he, he, didn't... he was writing book 18 and um, he did four chapters. So it was all okay. on his desk. The chapters were there written and yeah, very sad. So, yeah. 
Well, maybe it's, you could find an author that would like to carry it all on. I don't know. You know, you, you, that happens from yeah. time to time. People do that. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, and you, you've talked about Wilbur Smith, and Wilbur Smith has done, you know, oh, last, I'm going to say, five to ten years, he had ghostwriters. Yeah. So, you know, he would scope it out and then get somebody to write it for him. So, yeah, it's, I suppose there's a possibility of having that done. I can that do too. it. So do you still work or is this full time? This is what you do. You put full your dad's time. books out yeah. there. Right. Yeah. Right. You full publish time. them and now it's... now it's audio book. What a rewarding yeah. way to spend your life. And knowing that it's your dad's oh. work as well. It's so cool. Absolutely. And my son, he he lives he's he's living back in England and he does all the advertising. So it's his full time job as well. Right. So... And the and the covers you mentioned, because I said the cover, because the cover cover of Ben with the Wind is, is terrific. It, there's a tiny yeah. little bit of there at the top of the yes, of the thing. I, I just but the the thing is got it's it's some you mentioned that that was a uh, a, a well known illustrator that, that you got. Yeah, so our cover designer, his name is Stuart um Beish. Oh there's another chap we know and I get the I get the names muddled up. Um he's a company called Books Covered and um he has designed, as, as you mentioned, um, a lot of very famous uh, authors like Stephen King, wow. uh, John Le Carey. I think he's done a couple wow. of covers wow. as well. Yeah. yeah. So he was working for the very top publishing houses. Like I think he might even work for Harper Collins, for that matter. Right. Um, but he's now he's you know he runs his own um, uh, cover design company, um, and he's very sought after. Uh, yeah, yeah. But he also employs, I think, a couple of guys who works underneath them. So yeah, um, it's a classic so, cover. Yeah, he's it's nice. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, he's very talented. Yeah, we have a couple of people that work with us. So we have a fabulous editor, um, who a very professional editor. Um, so it, I just do the the initial edit, um, just to try and tidy up the manuscript as best as I can, and yeah. then Robin gets it and he he does what he needs to do. Yeah. Um, no, it was yeah, very, very well done. It, there wasn't a, you know, I work with a lot of authors and sometimes on the longer books, now and again, there's the odd typo or, or something. There was absolutely nothing in those 18.7 hours. There was there was nothing in it that, that was... Oh, that was well, not, I, picked, I, was, I picked up stuff. It was perfect. Oh, I, I did. Oh, and, well, that's good for you to say. <laughs> it was, and that was a first for me. The, the, usually there's something and I have to go to an author. Yeah. Uh, this word here, is this is this scene or bean? Or, or you know, whatever yeah. it is. It's, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. It, yeah. literally one letter will change and I'll go, I'm yeah. not sure about that. But there wasn't anything. In bed with the wind. Oh, that's <laughs> good. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. It's just yeah. great. It's called Bend with the Wind. It's by yeah. Peter Rimmer. It's now it's available on Kindle and everything and Amazon, but it is now an audio book and you can get it through Audible. If you'd like to get it for free, you can get it with a free 30 day trial. You can subscribe to Audible, which, you know, you can get yourself, um, you subscribe and then you can just download books. I think it's one a month you're allowed with a subscription, but uh, th there's all the details that are Audible. If you sign up for the free 30 day, free 30 day trial, you can download Ben with the Wind for free. And then at the end of the thirty days, if you don't want to carry on the trial, you've got the you've got the book downloaded. So uh, that might be something you want to do if you just want to check out uh, Peter Rimmer and some of his audio books. Uh, to get that free thirty day trial, there's a link in the description. There's also a link to PeterRimmer.com if you want to find out more about uh, Peter Rimmer. Uh, so what's next for you then, Heather? Um, well, concentrating definitely on audio books. Yes. And I'm going to start working on book number 15 in the Brigginshaw Chronicles. Yes. So that's my next next project. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, so fantastic quite, to talk yeah. to you. I hope everything's and going well in Portugal. And thanks for choosing me to, to bring it to life in audio. For oh, I thoroughly it's enjoyed it. It's just been amazing. It's just oh, been good. Great. I'm so glad. No, you've been amazing. Yeah. Oh, I really, really, yeah. really Thank did you. enjoy it. Looking forward to doing the next no, one. No, it's been great chatting. Yeah. And you too, Heather. Brilliant. We'll have to yeah. do this again when the next one comes out. Yeah. yeah. Good grief. Yeah. <laughs> Super. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Best of luck. Okay. Cheers. Okay. Good to talk to you. And you. Bye.